All right, now in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to see here is the first mention of this word in the Bible. Look down at verse 17. It says, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Now, we're going to get back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 much later in the sermon. But what I'm preaching about this morning is, is the lies of dispensationalism. Who's, who's ever heard of dispensationalism? It's a doctrine that's been around for a while. Um, and it, it's kind of common. I don't know how common it is, but it's definitely taught in many Baptist churches and other churches. But um, it's a wicked, false doctrine. And we're going to go through and expose this doctrine this morning. I'm going to lay out from the Bible why it's false. Now, there's a lot of false doctrine out there today, obviously. There's a lot of people who believe all kinds of crazy things. Um, you could find people who believe just about anything. And they'll try to twist scripture and make it fit whatever it is that they want to believe. They come up with some belief in their heart and they go back and try to make things fit in the Bible. That's, that's how a lot of false doctrines work. Or you just get people who are just completely unsaved and don't understand scripture whatsoever trying to understand it. And they come up with a lot of, a lot of weird uh, doctrines that don't make any sense. Now, as a preacher, I try to be balanced because... You know, I can't, I mean, it would be easy for me to just pick all false doctrines and just every service just preach against some false doctrine. But obviously, that's not, you know, that's not the whole focus. We need to be preaching other things like just what the Bible actually says and true doctrine, um, not just combating this. But this is a pretty serious one. This needs to be dealt with from time to time. People need to understand that. You're going to hear people teaching and preaching, and, and this comes up quite a bit, actually, of people who believe in this, this doctrine of dispensationalism. And um, that's why we're, we're going over it this morning, just to give you a clear understanding of what kind of what they teach and why it's wrong and why it's so um, perverted and false. Um, one of the things I find ironic about this particular doctrine, and actually there's so many false doctrines, people tend to cling to like a single verse. And, um, you know, people who believe in works-based salvation, oftentimes they'll turn to Matthew 7, which says, you know, depart from me, I never knew you. When, it's, when it talks about people being confronted with God and saying, look, Lord, we, you know, haven't we done all these great works? You know, we've cast out devils, we've done all this stuff. And they, and they use, it's, it's ironic because they use that scripture to try to prove, see, you need works to be saved when it's actually teaching exactly the opposite. And with dispensationalism, here's a big red flag. When you're talking to someone and they just keep on say, quoting this verse or referencing this verse in 2 Timothy 2.15 that says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Right? This is what we have on our banner out front. You know, rightly dividing the word of truth. If they, it, when you, you start to hear people just use that phrase over and over, you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. You've got to rightly divide the Bible. You've got to rightly divide. They're probably dispensationalists. Because this is what they use over and over and over again to justify what is. And, and just, you know, before I get too far ahead of myself, what is dispensationalism? For those of you that don't know, dispensationalism is, is this doctrine that was... Um, <clears throat> Found it, basically, there's, for, according to my research, there's a man called John Nelson Darby. He was the man that's, that's credited as being the father of dispensationalism. And this was just back in the 1800s. Okay, not, not that long ago. Um, he's credited as being the father of dispensationalism. And what it is, is it is a teaching that there are different ages or you know, periods. They call a dispensation a period of time. We're going to get into that later, why that's wrong. But... Um, Basically, they say there's, there's different periods of time and God dealt with people, with his people or with just the world in general differently in each of these one individual periods of time. So they'll have, and, and depending on, you know, there's all different varieties of this. So, you know, I'm going to say something and people say, oh, no, that's not dispensation. You know, there's, you know, some people believe there's seven dispensations. Some people believe there's three. Some people believe there's four, five, six, whatever. I mean. People argue about the details of, of how many ages they think there are and everything else. But basically, I think the most common one is that people believe that there's seven. And they start with like, you know, in the Garden of Eden, like before Adam sinned, that was one age. And then there's another age of, you know, between Adam sinning and, you know, Abraham or something. I don't know. Or the flood. Or, you know, I, I don't know exactly what they all are. Like, I don't have it all memorized. I didn't, like, learn and study that doctrine because it's false. And it's easy to prove false. 
But they basically just divide it up. They say there's the law. There's, um, you know, now we're in the, age, the church age or the age of grace. And then there's going to be, be the millennial reign of, of Christ or the kingdom age, right, at the end. And um, so th they basically say there's all these different ages. And, um, you know, whatever. I, I don't care if people want to say that just kind of divide up time in general and just say that they're chunked in these different groups. That doesn't really bother me so much as the teaching that they get into of the reason why they're even chunking them out to begin with is, to, is because they believe that things were way different, significantly different to the point even down to salvation. So those, these are the people that will say like, well, people in the Old Testament, they were saved by obeying the law. That if they did not bring their animal sacrifices, they would literally burn in hell for their sins if they did not bring the blood of bulls and goats and lambs to, to atone for their sins. And that is completely false. That's easy to be proved false from the Bible. Um, we're going to get into a little bit of that here in just a second. But back to the, the father of dispensationalism, John Nelson Darby. Now, if you're not familiar with him, for one, he is, well, first of all, he's, just a, he's a false prophet and he's burning in hell right now. And that is a fact. And people say, oh, how do you know? How do you know his heart? Well, the reason why I know is because John Nelson Darby is a man who, who created his own version of the Bible. Turn, if you would, please, to Revelation chapter 22. I'm going to show you this real quick just to prove how I know that John Nelson Darby is burning in hell. The Bible says in verse 18, it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, John Nelson Darby has taken away from God's word. And his translation of the Bible, you know, back in the late 1800s, this is before all the new modern versions came out. But it was still, I mean, a hundred, couple hundred years after the King James Bible has been out, has been used, has been accepted. He came up with his own translation, and guess what it lines up with? It lines up with all the modern versions, or, you know, mostly. He has Acts 8.37 removed. He has a bunch of other scriptures removed. He has, you know, he's tampered with God's word, which the Bible says if you, if you add to or remove from his word, you know, your name is out of the book of life. You're, you, are, you cannot be saved. He is a false prophet. He's a false teacher. Now, the first big red flag, if you believe in dispensationalism, is the guy credited as being the father of that doctrine. The guy who basically came up with that doctrine and really promoted and taught that doctrine because it was pretty new until that point. People, you know, it wasn't something that was taught until John Nelson Darby taught it and C.I. Schofield. And Schofield, of course, is, a, is popular in Baptist communities for his reference Bible. He made it, you know, in, in the King James Bible, C.I. Schofield put all his notes. And he's another false prophet. It's basically, he's just a Bible corrector. He tries to tell you the places where the Bible is incorrect. And actually, it, it shouldn't say this. It should say this. And he gives you all the reasons for that. And, um, you know, he believes, if you ever heard of the gap theory between Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.2, there is some huge... It, uh, amount of time where people existed and there's all kind, you know, dinosaurs or whatever, like all these other things in life existed between the verses of 1 and 2 in Genesis chapter 1. Just completely made up. I mean, you start reading Genesis 1, 1 and what, you know, it reads pretty normal and that's just saying, well, no, actually there's just this huge era, this huge age of time that God doesn't mention at all, but that's, that's why we find fossils. And that's why, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. It's because he doesn't believe the Bible. He doesn't believe the scripture. So he has to come up with ways to just make things up, to make things fit in his own mind. Now, um, and those are the two people that are the, the major pushers of this doctrine. So I'm not just going to rely on, you know, who is, who is credited as being a founder, but that should be a huge red flag for you that some false teacher, some false prophet is pushing this, this doctrine. But we're going to look into it even a little, uh, just a little bit more closely. 
And um, again, the greatest problem that I have with this teaching is that people use, you know, they, they claim that people used to be saved by works. And again, okay, just, just as a side note, the different methods of salvation, what people will call that today is hyper-dispensationalism. So there's all, you know, there's all these different varieties and flavors of this doctrine. But originally, dispensationalism was taught, was taught with, this, with this doctrine of people being saved um, by works, by the law, through other methods. Now, if you want to call it hyper-dispensationalism, again, I don't care, but it's, you know, the whole point of this doctrine and the whole point of separating it up is because they're saying that God deals with people differently. And um, I'm not going to get into this too much in detail, but turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 4. Turn to Romans 4 real quick. Because I preach an entire sermon about how people were saved in the Old Testament in my sermon. It's called Understanding the Old Testament. And there was two sermons. I think, I, I think it was part one where I just, I just completely went over salvation and how people were saved by grace through faith all throughout history. And that's the way people will always be saved until, until you know, the end of times. And um, in Romans chapter 4, let me get there myself. Romans chapter 4 destroys this doctrine that people were saved differently in the Old Testament. See, there's a lot of different, there's a few different Old Testament scriptures people like to turn to just to try to show, see, people were, were um, basically saved and they were forgiven by keeping the Old Testament, by keeping the law, and by doing these sacrifices. But in Romans chapter 4, let's start reading in verse number 1. The Bible reads, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Now, where's Abraham? Is Abraham New Testament or Old Testament? Old Testament. He's way Old Testament, right? Abraham came even before the Mosaic Law. He says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath war of to glory, but not before God. For what set the Scripture? The Scripture itself. I mean, this is talking about Old Testament Scripture. This isn't just talking about New Testament Scripture. What set the Scripture, referring to the Old Testament, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Again, very clear, just saying, look, even the scripture says that Abraham was justified when he put his faith in God. When Abraham believed God, that belief was counted unto him for righteousness. That is how his soul was saved. Now he goes on further to explain this. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So what he's saying there is that for a person doing works, to re when you receive a reward... You don't get that reward because just because of grace, because you didn't deserve it, you didn't earn it. If you're working for it, he's saying, no, it's out of debt. It's, it's owed to you. And I've used this example many times. You know, when I go to work and I put in 40 hours a week and then my, my boss gives me a paycheck, it's not a gift. It's not something undeserved that he's given to me, which would be grace. Grace is something you receive. It's free. Hey, it's a gift. It's not deserved. No, I earned it. He owes me that money. When I put in that time, when I work for my boss and, and I'm producing for him and I'm working, he owes me money because we've already made an agreement that if I work this much, he'll pay me this much. And that's the agreement. So he owes that. It's a debt to him. He has to, to make good on that debt every week, every two weeks or whatever to, um, because of the work that I've given to him and that I've worked for him. So that's all he's saying here is that, look, to him that worketh, is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So he's saying that, you know, someone who doesn't do any works, but they believe. That faith, that belief is counted for righteousness because that is what you, the reward that's received by grace. It's undeserved. It's not something that was attained and worked for. And he's, the reason he's even saying all this is because he's applying it to Abraham. But now we're going to see, look at verse number six. It says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Okay, again, King David, Old Testament saint, Old Testament, this, and this was, he was after the, he was like during the Mosaic law, during the time of the kings. We have Abraham, which was prior to that, which was in another dispensation. And then we have David in another dispensation of the Mosaic law. Both of them 
saying that salvation is coming by grace through faith alone. Not coming, no mention of the works of the law except that you don't have to do them to be saved eternally. Um, and it's kind of fun. It's, and, and that just destroys the whole doctrine of, of trying to say that people were, and there's lots of other scripture. I'm not going to go into them all if you're interested. Again, look at my old sermon um, that I preach about understanding the Old Testament. But um, this just came up recently because someone actually made a comment on that, on that sermon the other day on YouTube. And... Um, you know, people, I don't know what they think when they, when they get on the church site and they try to, like, try to explain why you're wrong. You know, I, I preach an entire sermon just proving, without a doubt, that this is, you know, this is what the Bible teaches. Yet they still think they're going to come in and be like, no, 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 you're wrong because of this verse or something. And, you know, I don't mind. Honestly, I don't mind. Um, especially if I am wrong. Like, I look at it and um, if I'm wrong about something and you can show me the scripture to prove it, great. Okay, so I, I don't want to get, you know, too caught up with saying, oh, yeah, the, you know, these people are, you don't um, think they're going to change my mind. But on something like this, I mean, this is, this is so blatant and so obvious from Scripture that, that it, it's completely evident. And, and what he responded to when I brought up Romans 4, his only rebuttal was that David and Abraham were exceptions. Well, they're exceptions to the rule. <laughs> like, there's a teaching in the New Testament specifically geared to explain how salvation was always by grace and the two examples he gives are, oh well those just happen to be exceptions like well how many more people would he have had to brought up before you're gonna say oh well that's an exception too oh oh yeah that per oh yeah they're an exception too oh yeah Elijah oh yeah he's an exception too it falls on his face and um, it, it's just ridiculous um, anyways that is my, my main problem with dispensationalism is that, is, I guess you call it hyper-dispensationalism, is the, is the teaching that people were saved in other ways. Because it, it, it falls on its face. There's no way people have ever been saved through the works of the law. And what it comes down to is a, is a misunderstanding of people being forgiven. And there's two senses of, of being forgiven. One is your soul being forgiven in the eternal sense. Right? The, that Christ has, has shed His blood for your sins to pay and atone for all of your sins so you don't have to pay that punishment of hell. But there's another way that we could be forgiven. And that's why, um, you know, even in the New Testament, it says that if we don't forgive others, the, you know, God's not going to forgive us. And, and again, people get, get mixed up on that verse as well and verses similar to that because they try to apply that to our eternal salvation, to that free gift of eternal life, where there's really two ways we're, that we are forgiven. One is just eternally with Christ, you know, um, paying for all of our sins. But the other one is in this lifetime. Because we reap what we sow in this lifetime. And when we, um, we transgress God's law, He can show mercy unto us. But He'll also judge us according to what we do in this lifetime. It's not something He's going to punish us for in everlasting fire if we're saved. But as His children, He'll chasten and chastise us which, if we go to him with a repentant heart and, you know, and, and confess and forsake our sins, he'll show mercy on us and forgive us those sins, meaning that he's not going to judge us in this lifetime with some things that maybe he would judge us for. Um, and, and maybe he'll show mercy unto us. And there's, you know, so there's two different ways of forgiveness. And, um, and it's the same thing in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, people would would bring their sacrifices to kind of get right with God. I mean, you're familiar with that term of getting right with God? You know, there's, there's in one sense, you, you need to get right with God just by getting saved, by putting your faith in Christ and having all of your sins washed away through the blood of Christ. The other way of getting right with God is, is trying to do what's right and trying to obey His commandments and try to um, live the way that He's told us to live. Um, so it's a lot of confusion that these dispensations, so they'll pick out verses that pertain to the one and apply it the wrong way. And again, it's ironic because they say you need to rightly divide the word of truth. And they fail to do so completely. It, it's, um, they divide it up into too many pieces. Basically, here's rightly dividing the word of the truth. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's the division. That, that is a dividing line that God has given unto us. There's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And that's the division all that we really need to understand 
um, about the Bible is that there is an old covenant and a new covenant, and um, that's rightly dividing, and that divides it right in, right into two. Now, a lot of dispensationalists will also try to pick and choose which parts of the Bible are directed for us today. They'll, some people say like, oh, well, we only really need to follow the epistles of Paul that were written to the Gentiles, you know, because the Gospels were written to the Jews. And, these, you know, like, and, and they'll just pick apart all these different books of the Bible. And they'll say, and some people are real narrow. Like, they'll just say, like, well, it's only like these books are, are pertaining to this age, to this era where we're at today. And, like, nothing else applies to us. And that's false. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The Bible says all Scripture is profitable for doctrine. It's not, all, you know, it's not only in whatever age you're at, it's just for this section of Scripture. It's all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Um, and because they, they like to pick and choose what portions are directed for us and which parts of the Bible that we have to live by and that we should, we should look to, it drastically in, impacts how they interpret the Bible. So when you and I would normally look at the Bible and you see verses in there, you know that because God's Word is perfect, because you believe that God's Word is true, there are no lies, there's no errors, you know, God doesn't contradict Himself. So when you come across something and you don't quite understand it, you know, obviously everything needs to harmonize. So when, when, you, when you read it, maybe there's something you don't understand, you say, well, this has to fit in with the whole of the Bible. Because we, we you know, look to all of the Bible and the only changes that were made between the New Testament and the Old Testament are the ones that were already specifically mentioned, you know, especially in the book of Hebrews and a few other places, about what has changed specifically. So we know it's been laid out, okay, these few things have changed, but other than that, everything else pretty much harmonizes just fine. And if we don't understand something, then it's just our lack of understanding, but we're not going to try to fit a square peg through a round hole to get something to work, which is basically what they have to do, because when they start saying, well, this only applies to us, you know, they've got all these other scriptures to deal with, and that's one of the ways they deal with, with their false doctrines is just saying, oh, well, you can't use this scripture to interpret this one because those are just talking to two different people altogether. And you, you just can't use that. Um, but this, this will then have an impact on other doctrines. Anytime you have, you have a, a significant false doctrine, it always impacts other areas of the Bible. Because the Bible is so networked and mingled together with, its, with the way that everything has to be harmonized and has to fit together in order to be perfect, when you start veering off on one doctrine, you're going to affect other doctrines, other key doctrines um, of the Bible in order to make, try to make everything fit together. You're going to have to start, start skewing some other, some other aspects and start fiddling with, with other doctrines to get everything to try to fit together. And what I've noticed and what, I seem, what I've come to believe and, and understand is that people believe in dispensationalism will, will also believe in Zionism and the pre-trib rapture. Like the, the dispensationalism, Zionism, and pre-trib rapture all kind of get mingled and, and twisted together in order to make scripture try to fit with the, the way that they view the Bible and the way that they, they view everything. And, it's, and it really is just a twisting of scripture to try to make things fit to try to make their doctrines make sense. Now, um, Zionism, if you don't know, it's just basically, um, you know, I use that word meaning that they, they hold people, the physical seed of, of Abraham, the physical children of Israel in a high regard as being, you know, special people set apart that, that God is still going to bring forth promises on and everything else. And, um, and you know, these are the people that will say, no, we need to support Israel because you know, if we don't bless them, then God's going to, you know, if we curse them, God's going to curse us. But if we bless them, then God's going to bless us. These are the same people that, that believe in that nonsense. Um, and I'm not saying that everyone who's a Zionist, a Zionist, or whatever, but these, these three doctrines seem to, to be co-mingled in their beliefs. And um, you try to show them verses like, turn, to, turn if you would to Matthew 24. I'll we'll cover this real briefly about the, the pre-trib rapture. Man, I have to hurry. Matthew 24. 
What am I going to skip? Okay. So Matthew 24, look at verse 21 real quick. The Bible says, for then, sh the, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Talking about the tribulation, the great tribulation, right, in verse 21. Jump down to verse 29. The Bible says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with, with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Sounds a lot like the rapture to me. Jesus Christ coming back, coming in the clouds, the angels gathering together his elect. Right? But what, they'll, what the dispensationalists will do is say, no, 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 no. See, that's just talking to the Jews. That's just talking to the... See, that doesn't apply to us at all. And, and <laughs> it's like there's a repeat of history for everything because you have, you know, what, there's verses in Thessalonians. Well, Thessalonians was written to, to Gentiles. You know, it wasn't written to the Jews that will basically line up and say the same things as what's written in the Gospel of Matthew. And... You know, I mean, try to say that the Gospels were written to the Jews and just for the Jews and are not for us is pretty ridiculous. I mean, think about all the doctrine. That's, that's basically everything that Jesus Christ said. You know, you're going to say like, oh, well, that's just, that's just, for, the, that's just for the Jews. Because this was, this, he just went to the Jews. That's silly. That, that is foolish to, to, to take that approach and say, yeah, none of that's for us. And um, so they'll, they'll try to say, that, oh, yeah, that was just for the Jews. That's just for the elect. That's not for us. Well, then why does Mark 13, which is the parallel passage for Matthew 24, why is at the end of Mark 13 does it say, and what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. It wasn't just for his disciples. It wasn't just for the Jews. It was for all. He's saying, look, what I'm telling you, I'm going to tell everybody. Watch. Because Jesus Christ is going to be coming back. So that's what, and that's what the, the reference is. Now, um, I'm not, I have to skip over this because I really want to get into just the word dispensation. I have to skip this whole what they believe on the elect and the children of Israel just for sake of time. So what does the word, let's just think about disp you know, dispensationalism. They'll, they'll say you know, a dispensation is, a, is an age, it's a period of time. Well, let's think about that for a second. For, what does the word dispense mean? You know what dispense means? If you have a dispenser, what does it do? It gives things out, right? It, it, it's like, a, like a, a paper towel dispenser dispenses paper towels. It gives them out, right? If you think of, um, I like the, the analogy that the Pastor Anderson used of, of a Pez dispenser. Right? Everyone knows what a Pez dispenser is. You lift up the little head and Pez comes out. It dispenses Pez. So basically, you know, the, the word dispense which is the, you know, where the word dispensation comes from. Basically, there's a few meanings, but the, main, the primary reason, the number one definition is just giving out. You know, just, just giving out. And we're going to see that here. Turn, if you would, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is where we started reading this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Because here's the thing. This, the word dispensation is only used four times in the Bible. And we're going to look at all four times. They're trying to claim, oh, dispensa you have these dispensations and these periods of time and all this other stuff. Well, let's just look at all the places where the word dispensation is even used and try to understand what, what it means. And see if it's talking about, you know, there's seven eras, yet it's only, it's only found four times in the Bible. So I don't know where they're, where they're dividing up into, into seven places. If you can't, you know, if the, the word itself is only found four times, but... Look at um, verse number 16 of 1 Corinthians 9. It says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So right here, he's saying a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So Paul has been committed with, he's been charged with 
dispensing the gospel. Does that make sense? He's basically saying, look, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He said, my job, my duty is to go out and to preach the gospel to every creature. That's my job. He's saying, look, you know, it's, it's not just something that, that is um, voluntary in the sense that I don't have to do this. He says, no, God has charged me with this. This is, this is my duty. This is something that I have to do. I have to go out and preach the gospel. Whatever. It's been committed unto me. That's my job. To dispense the gospel. To give it out. Is there anything about a period of time there? No. So the first mention here we see nothing to do with a period of time. Just that he, Paul has been charged with dispensing the gospel, with giving out the gospel, with preaching the gospel to people. Let's look at the, at the, the second uh, reference that we're going to turn to here in Ephesians. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians 3, we are going to see a mention to ages, but we're going to still see what the word dispensation means. And... Um, and cover that real, real quickly. Ephesians 3, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. So it says here, verse 2, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given, so again, which is given me, right? Something that's given to him. He's given a dispensation of something. Over here, it's of the grace of God. He's, you know, God's poured out his grace. He's given his grace to him. But it's something that's been dispensed. It's something that's been given. This isn't, God didn't give Paul a period of time. He didn't say, okay, Paul, here's a period of time. This is a dispensation. You know, I'm, it's the dispensation, Paul, here, you know, take this period of time. That's not what he did. That's ridiculous. But here's where I think they, they kind of come up with this stuff. Look at verse number five. It says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So they're saying, you know, is there a mention to other ages? Yes. What he's saying that in the past, and this is the way that, that God has revealed himself unto man anyways, is that man did not start out with all of God's word, right? Throughout time, God has been revealing more and more of his word um, to the people, but it doesn't change the core doctrines. Just because people were given, you know, maybe not a, the full understanding and, the, and, the, and all of the scripture doesn't mean that the same truth hasn't existed all throughout, right? So like salvation. Salvation has always been by grace. Now, they didn't have the book of John. They didn't have all these New Testament books to really help just, just make things known, you know, to make it really clear for them. But they had other things. They had other, they had, they had all the Old Testament scriptures to help point them that way. So what he's saying here is that in other ages, you know, some of these truths were not made known unto them as it is now revealed. He's saying it wasn't made known then. See, back then it was more like um, it was a shadow of things to come. The Bible talks about the sacrifices and things. They were a shadow. They, they were a foreshadowing of what is going to come. And it was still teaching that same truth about Jesus Christ. It was still teaching all the same truths, but it was a, maybe a little bit darker, a little bit harder to understand, yet it was still there. It was still evident in everything. But he says now it's been revealed. It's just it's there's a, rev, a you know revelation opening up of of the scripture. And what was that specific one that he's talking about here? Is that the that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs? That was the specific thing that he was talking about because the Jews historically have thought, and it's evident in the Book of Acts and in other places that they were because they were God's chosen people. That like you know the the Gentiles had no part at all 
with salvation and with God. And that's why they didn't even eat with them. They didn't, you know, and they got to the point to where they viewed the Gentiles basically as subhuman, which was wrong. It was incorrect. And that teaching was still in the Old Testament that, that you know, the, gen the fullness of times would come and the Gentiles would be made fellow heirs. But he's saying that, you know, you didn't quite understand that. He says, now it's just been revealed. Now it's being revealed unto you. Um, God showed that to Peter in his vision. But um, the truth was always there. It's just been, the light has been shined on it, you know, in the New Testament to give them just a better, fuller understanding of what it is. Um, turn, if you would, I got to hurry up, Colossians chapter 1. So that's the, that's the second mention that we've turned to of dispensation. Again, it was given to Paul. It wasn't a period of time that was given to him. It was the grace of God is what was given to him. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse number 21. We'll start reading verse 21 of Colossians 1. It says, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereby Paul made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Again, dispensation of God, which is given to me. It's something that's given to him. It's been dispensed to him. Um, he's made a minister according to that dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints. So again, we see a reference to ages and generations, but it's the same exact context, the same exact thing that was, we just read um, in the previous example, that he has given more knowledge now to these truths. And because God has given Paul that knowledge, God has, has, has opened it up unto Paul, Paul is now being a minister and preaching it unto others and just show him that. He says, To whom God, in verse 27, would make known what is the riches of the glory of, his, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Now, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 1. This is the last place the word dispensation is even used in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 1. Because we're, so far we've seen dispense as something that's given out, something that's been, you know, dispensation, it's been, it's been given out. There is another, it's a very similar meaning of the word, and you can see how they, how they correlate. But um, dispensing can also mean like doing away with. Not like necessarily giving to someone, but just doing away with. Like, have you ever heard this phrase, you know, let's dispense with the formalities. Let's, let's, let's put that aside. Let's do away with that. You know, let's, we're, we're done with formalities. We don't need that anymore. Let's, let's do away with it. Keep that in mind now as we read Ephesians 1. Look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together, together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, this is talking about a future event. Look at verse number 10 again. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one 
all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So he's talking about gathering together all things, both in heaven and on earth, into one. This hasn't happened yet. This is at the dispensation of the fullness of times. And you could see, we'll see this. Turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 10. And we'll see how this ties in. This dispensation, you know, the, basically the completing of, the kind of the doing away with the fullness of times. Okay. Look at Revelation chapter 10. Look at verse number 5. Because this is something that's going to happen in the future. Um, the Bible says in verse number 5 of Revelation 10, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Right? This is the dispensation of the fullness of times when all of a sudden there is time no longer. Right? Time is going to cease to exist. There's going to be time no longer, according to Revelation 10. It says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So that's when at the time of the seventh angel sounding is at the fullness of times when there should be time no longer. In verse, uh, chapter 11, look at verse number 5 of Revelation 11, or 11, 15, sorry. Verse 15 of Revelation 11 says, And the seventh angel sounded. This is when the seventh angel actually sounds. It says, And there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. This lines up perfectly with the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. When Christ's kingdom comes to this earth, when he sets up that kingdom, those that are in heaven and those that are on earth are just are joined together at the fullness of times when there's time no longer. This is a future event. This is something that, that's, that's, you know, and again, the dispensation is the doing away with the time. It's not, you know, if anything, the closest thing that's going to come up, you say this is an age or a period. Yeah, but the word dispensation never means period of time. It's just, it's just completely redefining the word. It has nothing to do with that. This, the word dispense, obviously we've gone over that. Um, basically, what, I, what I've come to find is, is with a lot of people that study, this, you know, that hold this dispensationalist doctrine, um, at least the ones who really are hyper dispensations. You know, I've talked to people that, that say, well, you know, I know that people have been saved by grace through faith all throughout history. And then it's kind of like you start pinning them down on some stuff and they, they believe right on all these other things. It's like, why are you, why do you even, what's the point of even having these ages then? You know what I mean? Like, like, I've talked to someone who tried to say, well, weren't things like a little bit different maybe when Adam and Eve were around before they sinned because they were in the Garden of Eden? Well, yeah, they were a little bit different, but it doesn't mean that God's word was any different. It doesn't mean that, that they were living under different rules necessarily, right? It doesn't mean that they were saved different or any other core doctrine is, is changed, right? Um, but these people who try to tell you that, you know, these parts of the Bible aren't for us. Oh, this is for the Jews. The Jews are, are a special group of people, even today, that, that just, um, you know, that, I don't know what, I mean, I, I can't make sense of some of their, um, their stuff on the Jews. But basically, uh, this scripture comes to mind. There's two scriptures that come to mind. In 1 Timothy 1, 6, the Bible says, From which, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Um, you know, a lot of these people, they, they, they try to be teachers. They want to say, oh, I know how to rightly divide the word of truth. And I'm going to teach you. See, look, you got to divide this up here and divide this up here and divide this here. And they don't even understand what they're saying. And um, Hebrews 5.12 also says, for when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. 
even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Um, basically, just be aware of this doctrine, this dispensationalist doctrine. Um, again, there's a lot of people out there that, that kind of cling to this. And anytime you find some, oh, you got to learn how to rightly divide the word truth. Oh, you, you could red flag just be like, yeah, they're probably dispensationalist. They probably believe that there's these different periods of time and that there's all these different rules for all these different periods. But we need to understand that God has divided his word already for us into two covenants. The old covenant and the new covenant. And even in the old covenant, they knew that the new covenant was coming. They knew that Christ... The, the Bible says that Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? If he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, you know... Um, that covers all time. He was slain, yeah, physically he was slain, you know, in, 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 in a moment. But it was all part of the plan and all part of Scripture all throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. Um, so don't let people try to, try to turn, you know, twist you around on, on um, dividing the word of truth. And ultimately what it is is just a way for them to try to negate other parts of the Bible that have clear teaching because they'll say, oh, well, that doesn't apply to us. Just like people today want to say, oh, well, the Old Testament doesn't apply to us, so we don't have to follow any laws because that's what they had to do to be said, you know, that's what they had to do, but we don't have to do that now, we're under grace. And it's just a cop-out, and it's just um, an excuse for trying to make excuses for God's Word instead of just taking it all for what it is and what it really says in, in its entirety. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. Thank you for making it so clear for us, dear God, that you've, you've divided it um, into, into two covenants. I pray that you please help us to, um, to understand your words and we can get the totality of it and we could use all scripture for doctrine and for instruction in righteousness, dear God, and that you would just teach us and guide us through the Holy Spirit, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.